Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the Old Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the D program. And boy, oh boy, is this probably going to be a D program for the ages, or at least for the duration that this podcast is online. And that is because Michael Joseph is back in the house for the third time to wade into the deep end of his most recent YouTube series that centers around a conflict that he describes as the old versus the new world order in relationship to a Catholic or universal doctrine. And that phrase, new world order, conjures many ideas and images, but with it comes a question not asked by many. If there's a new world order, what then is the old world order? And that is a question Mike has sought to answer, and it's an answer that will spiral out in directions that I, for one, did not expect, because it calls into question the occult and esoteric doctrines we're all familiar with, and it examines where they may have come from, who may be the true authors of them, and what the secret doctrine they might be trying to impart onto us, the profane masses, so to speak. This is a hell of a conversation, and the Patreon extension is well worth a listen as well, where Mike and I chat for another full hour about what he calls the Golems of the Pharisees. More on that after the chat, which begins right about now. Michael Joseph, man, welcome back to the show. Really nice to hear your voice again, dude. Well, thanks for having me on, Ryan. It's been a while, and I'm always happy to talk with you. Hey, the feeling is mutual, man. And uh, we have a lot to talk about, too. You've been working on a a series of videos here recently that I think I would describe it as your sort of magnum opus. And I think maybe you've kind of alluded to that, too, of all this work that you've been doing over the last few years. Probably the peak or the pinnacle of what you've been doing on your YouTube channel. And, you know, one of the first things that you said in the intro to this series of videos, which focuses on occult Catholicism and this concept of old versus new world order, one of the things you said in the introduction to the series was that you were going to use occult terms, but you were going to redefine them. And you actually threw out the phrase occult Catholic gnosis, which I'd love for you to define for us if you'd like. But I think the best place to start is actually with you and your personal journey with this material that we'll be talking about. I know you've struggled with some of what you've been researching the last few years, and I'm right there with you, actually. But, you know, let's tell the audience a bit about those personal struggles and how it led you down this new path you forged uh, with this latest video series. Sure. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. But um, basically, you know, since we last talked, I was probably about done the occult science series and then going on to some of the shorter mini series after that. And the whole premise of that was really just showing how intertwined all of this occultism is into our society and how it's found in a lot of, quote unquote, secular institutions like science and, you know, things that are supposed to be devoid of religion. Right. And so that was kind of like a, I guess I'll call it neutral series where there wasn't really a narrative that I was providing or even wanted to provide because I just didn't really know exactly how I felt about all these things I had opinions and stuff like that, but I had no real basis or no real, um, I guess, foundation that I felt solid upon. And so it was just sort of going through and showing people how intertwined this stuff is and then saying, hey, you know, I'm just trying to make people aware of this. And then you got to kind of figure out on your own what it means to you, because I was still doing that, you know. And I guess to summarize the transition from that into occult Catholicism is that I think when you look at these things, you know, you read through all these occult books and then you listen to the, in the quote unquote truther world, as I'll call it, you kind of get these two different camps where there's sort of like a Protestant evangelical ish type Christian viewpoint on all the things going on or quote unquote conspiracy where, you know, all this occult stuff is bad. It's all pagan mysticism and you should just not look at any of it kind of thing. You know, it's like you you see a triangle somewhere, an obelisk, and you kind of freak out about it, right? (laughs) There's sort of that camp. And I definitely dove into that viewpoint of it all. I took it very seriously. I, I was in that kind of Protestant mindset for like three or four, maybe five months. And then like with anything, I kind of view it as like, there's different pools or different different ponds of viewpoints that you can either dip your foot into or you can jump in 
and how long you're going to stay in that. So I kind of look at it as I, I jumped into the Protestant pool and I stayed in it for about three or four months and I jumped out and I was trying to figure out what kind of leeches might have been stuck to me <laughs> that I wanted to get rid of. Right. And like, <laughs> yeah. is this, is this water really clear or not? You know what I mean? So there's some clarity, but then there's some things I found very revolting. And a lot of it was the behavior of people and how they treated others who were looking at occultism or new age. And also that they, they tended to build up straw men against the occultists where that's what led me to reading books like, you know, Blavatsky, Isis Unveiled, Secret Doctrine, Albert Pike, Morals and Dogma. And then I really got heavy into reading that stuff. And I started realizing, you know, the more I read it, the more I thought that a lot of these Protestant viewpoints, the way that they were attacking it was only helping occultism look good. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like they built up all these straw men about what Baphomet represented and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just like, honestly, I was like, you know what? Kind of the joke is on them. Like the way these occultists view it, it's almost like everything that they do, it's like kind of reversed and turned upon them in a lot of instances. But at the same time, when I looked at a lot of these occult viewpoints, I was used to particular Protestants, you know, debunking, I guess. I don't really love using that term you know, things like zeitgeist. And I realized that there still was a lot of stuff on the occult side that I didn't really find to be overly logical, but they would call it truth. And this is the only way you can do it and that kind of stuff. So it's weird because I just, in my mindset, I'm kind of like caught in the middle of these two polarities, these two viewpoints that I kind of consider a dialectic now, where there's aspects of both that I resonate with, but for different reasons. And there's aspects of both that I kind of really did not like or even loathed <laughs> in particular instances. You know, some of it is the the arrogance on one side that's kind of more overt, and then the arrogance at other side is more passive and like self righteous kind of thing. And so, I just I don't know. Like that was where I was kind of confused about. But then I started reading more into occultism, and I, I noticed that like Madame Blavatsky, especially just absolutely can't stand the Jesuits or the Catholic church. And then you hear on the Protestant side that there's this big Jesuit conspiracy and they run everything and they're the the source of all evil. And I'm like, I don't understand why the Protestants hate the Jesuits and the Catholic church, but then the occultists hate the Jesuits and the Catholic church. And so they, they seemingly unify on that, but they don't really like, it's almost like that part is completely missed and everyone's caught and them bashing each other and whether Jesus existed or not, or he was an astro theology myth. Right. And so I just thought that was weird because to me, it's like kind of imitating left and right politics, right? I mean, there's, it, there's issues that the left will argue with the right about, and there's issues that I, I will side with one side or the other, but I don't align with either viewpoint. You know what I mean? That's kind of how I always grew up. I was kind of in the middle with that spectrum, and I never, I never really understood how people would you know, get overly invested in one side or the other. And then you start thinking about it when you get into the, the truther world that the people who tend to seemingly be in control of both sides, the, the international policies don't really change, you know, whether it's left or right. And so now I'm, I, I began to think like, you know, is there some sort of spiritual aspect of this where, you know, the left, right politics is a temporal world. And then Protestantism and occultism is like the esoteric world or the spiritual world of that same dialectic. And that's when I started looking into the Catholic perspective. And I was really amazed to find how both sides attack it in a very unfair way and almost a very ignorant way, but also a very uh, dishonest way sometimes. And I'm not defending the Catholic church in terms of like it always being this amazing institution, but what ended up happening was you have these two sides claiming to know the truth and then they are bashing something that they think is evil in ways that I think were incredibly deceptive and just uninformed while they both call themselves enlightened. So I'm like, that's hypocrisy, you know? And so I started stumbling across people like E. Michael Jones. He was just saying all these things that I was just like, oh my God, like (laughs) I I was not aware of any of this stuff. And I just, I started combining secular history, you know, researching university level books that tend to be very expensive and drains my pocketbook. (laughs) And then combining what the occult writers say, combining what I've heard in the Protestant world. And so I'm just, the whole series is trying to culminate all the viewpoints that I've looked at and then see what uh, is a common thread. 
And what was left over is there seems to be a hidden battle that's above this dialectic of Protestantism and occultism where it's really a Catholic Jewish battle. And what I mean by that is it's a religious battle. It's not a, it's not a racial battle. There's a whole lot of stuff about anti-Semitism where people think you're talking about race, but you're talking about a particular mindset, especially related to the Talmud and the Zohar and the idea of the Gentiles being beasts or cattle. And uh, once you really start understanding the Catholic viewpoint on its own terms without a lot of the propaganda and without growing up in like the 20th century version, you know, the Vatican II version where it's really just this incredibly watered down, almost Protestant type or Freemasonic type in a way of church. Then you start realizing that there's a coherent narrative to the last 2000 years of history that actually makes sense. And my whole point is, that's a battle that to me is, is a reality and is going on. And then I leave it up to the people to decide what they think about the battle, if they want to choose a side or remain in the middle. But I think that when you re- remain in the middle, you actually end up in this dialectical battle on some level. At least that's my personal viewpoint on it. So that's kind of where I'm at with it now. And the whole thing researching was just a, a very strange experience of learning objective facts and then combining it with my own subjective experience in the world and dealing with people throughout my 36 and 37 years of living. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a step back and look at this from a, a personal macro level then. Would you say that you approach this material as unbiased as you could? Yeah, I would say so because I honestly, if you watch some of my older videos, I uh, tended to have a a bit of what I call now like Protestant rage. (laughs) And I think for good reason, you know, I think that the current version of the Vatican and Pope Francis, I just, Pope Francis kind of makes me ill, just all the crazy globalist shit he's pushing. And I, I guess, you know, I was always very angry towards what I saw in the church hierarchy just from a kind of, um, I guess, a passive viewpoint, you know, it wasn't something I actively like sought out to think about what, what is the Vatican doing right now when I was younger? It's just stuff you hear in, in peripheral chatter. And so I was actually probably really against the church. But the reason I realized that there's something else going on is that a lot of my angst, I, I just found that I was pre-programmed. I had been programmed in certain ways to view it in ways that once I looked at it objectively, like, oh my God, like I have to admit that there's been a coordinated effort to discredit the church in instances where it doesn't deserve the discredit, or there's a complex issue of infiltration and this sort of scapegoat ritual, as I call, where there's certain groups that will do bad things and then they'll cloak consciousness as focusing the light on the church while they kind of get away with some things. And so I'd say I was pretty objective about it because I came into it kind of blown away at how ignorant I was to so many things and just history. And it was a very humbling experience. I guess from the personal angle, I grew up Catholic. I was never, I was, I was kind of one of those things you just did. Like I got confirmed and then I got the hell out of there. I was like, okay, this appeases my dad. And I I don't, I never had any like pent up rage for it, but I, I was just kind of indifferent. You know, I'm like, well, not for me. And I never really looked back and I never intended on looking back, you know, when you're an 18 year old kid, especially growing up in the, uh, the late nineties, early two thousands, you just want to go out and have fun. And, you know, for me, I was trying to be a musician and working really hard at that. And, uh, I never thought I would look back. And, um, and then you get into all this conspiracy stuff and looking at the world with this hidden lens I guess it just ended up being the logical conclusion that this is a viewpoint that is very hidden from people. And I think it's for good reason. So yeah, I think that there is an objective part of it where I was really surprised to be even considering <laughs> this viewpoint. And now that I realize there's so many different angles that attack it in so many different ways, and they all have a lot of common roots that are kind of disturbing. And, you know, that's really what the series tries to highlight. Absolutely. And you also noted that you corrected in this series some past errors and made some new distinctions regarding some of the religious terms that you've used before. And I think you kind of touched on this already, but I want to ask this anyways. You mentioned that you were calling, for example, like Protestant Christianity, you were calling that Orthodox Christianity, but that may not be entirely accurate. So, you know, tell us a little bit about some of these 
distinctions in these terms that you think are worth making here for the audience? Well, I guess I was calling it Orthodox with a lowercase o. So Orthodox Christianity is like Eastern Orthodoxy, Byzantine Christianity, Russian Orthodox, stuff like that. And that was the split or the schism 1054 AD, where the Catholic Church split into the East and West, basically. And so what I was kind of doing was I was really only exposed to the Protestant evangelical type of Christianity. And I was just, I guess I was under this impression that the Catholic Church was just the beast and there was all of this occultism mixed into it. And it was just sort of, it was always controlled from the beginning, despite having aspects of quote unquote orthodox Christianity because I was just really uninformed basically. And I was, I had been overly exposed to the Protestant viewpoint. So I was just completely in ignorance and talking shit (laughs) that I shouldn't have been talking. But, you know, I I think that happens to a lot of us because I think there's a concerted effort to make it so where the only type of Christianity we tend to notice in the West is Protestant Christianity. I mean, I can go out in my town and see billboards for Jesus, right? (laughs) And I saw billboards for the rapture and stuff like that. So it's like, obviously, they have no problem pushing it. And I'm like, you know, if this stuff is so dangerous to the New World Order, why do they, why do I see all these Jesus signs? You know what I mean? Like, and that was just, I I guess I realized that I just thought Catholicism was just some bastardized version of Christianity that was always corrupt because that's the Protestant viewpoint on it. And so, Ironically, taking that view, you realize once you look into it how ignorant you are and how some very simple things distinguish them. And a lot of it really has to do with the way you interpret the book of Revelation. And then also that the pagan elements in Catholicism, the way I understand it now, it's actually it's a reverence for the parts of paganism that Christianity found to be in line with the truth. And then Protestantism tends to really hate pagan stuff. And I think that that also relates back to these sort of Talmudic doctrines. And so my bridge was really just astrology. You know, I was an astrologer. I am an astrologer. I mean, obviously, we did a a reading way back when I was in my infant stages of kind of learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought that was weird, because I'm like, where does this fit in? Because I find true things in it. But I I get the, uh, the dangers of like being overly enamored with certain types of it that I just never really resonated with. So then I started realizing that Catholicism is really the only type of Christianity that even allows astrology. And it's, it's part of the, the Middle Ages and Thomas Aquinas. And when I started looking into some of the Catholic viewpoints in astrology, I was like, wow, the way they view it is exactly how I organically came to find it to be useful. And so that was really the, the gap, the, the, the bridge to looking at the perspective more clearly and I guess as we go through it, it will probably be easier to outline the differences. But um, yeah, so I was really under a, a Protestant lens, I guess, not not even knowing it. And I just thought that that's what Christianity was. So it was a little embarrassing for me once I went through the Catholicism to realize how stupid I was on a lot of this stuff. So <laughs> yeah, well, let's get into some of the meat of these videos then. Uh, you mentioned in one of your introductory videos to this series, and I mentioned this term already, occult Catholic gnosis. That lays a pretty, I think, good foundation for the conversation and for the series as a whole. So define that term for us. Yeah, I mean, just the way I look at it, gnosis or, or wisdom or sophia, right, That the, um, the Greek word, that's kind of a buzzword, you know, that you hear out in the truther world. So you kind of have to define what is wisdom, what is knowledge, right? Those are kind of the distinctions. And so the Catholic viewpoint of these things is going to be different than a Protestant viewpoint and different than maybe the occult hermeticist viewpoints, but there are areas where it can overlap in like the broad terms of the macro terms. So like we just mentioned, wisdom or Sophia is, that's a word, right? It's, it's how you define it. Like freedom, you know, okay, freedom, everyone thinks freedom and liberty. I want that, but people define those things very differently. And when people get too caught up on the macro and they don't make the distinctions, that's kind of how we get duped, right? I mean, that's why we, go to war for freedom. (laughs) But is it really freedom for us? Or is it freedom for another group to have more control over humanity? And we just get tricked on these macro big picture words. So to me, it's it's a lot of blending the macro and the micro in a way that makes sense. They harmonize together, they work together. And it's it's the same I view with the personal subjective nature and then the objective world, where you're making observations and, and calculations upon patterns you see. But then there's also a personal experience aspect that's part of like your soul and your 
emotions that harmonizes with that. And so I guess for me, I found that there's aspects of occultism and hermeticism that I didn't really see any problem with in that kind of broad macro sense, like alchemy, right? If you're taking two opposite views and you're trying to understand them both, and then you put them together, and then you figure out what are the, what is the lead from these viewpoints that I want to purge, and what are the things that I think are harmonizing, and what can I birth into a new union or understanding? I mean, that, to me, that's just a smart way to approach things, right? I mean, that's just an, an organic function of our our minds, and also it's like you can relate it to playing an instrument, right? I mean, when I was learning guitar, I realized that I had to do some things with my picking hand and and, and just isolate that. And, and learn that really well, or you know, get that in check. And then I do things with my fretting hand and try to get those things. And I didn't have to worry about my picking hand if I tried to put them together. One might screw up the other. So you kind of isolate both hands, and then you put them together, see where you're at. You'd be like, okay, shit, I still need to work more in this fretting problem. So let me do that. And then you, you know, you do these exercises where you're going back and forth, left and right. You're getting one hand isolated, the other hand bring it to that side, then you bring them together. And, you know, that's just how you get better at something. So to me, that's a process. But when it gets applied to something, and there's more distinctions involved, and you're actually trying to purge something in particular. And this is what I talk about purging the old world order. That is where I think a lot of this occult hermeticism is designed to do just that. And then you realize that there's certain groups out there that want to purge that old world order and bring about this new world order. And I think there's a lot of instances where a lot of the viewpoints that get promoted are actually only helping that viewpoint, or it's sort of neutralizing where, you know, like in the truth or world, again, I I can use that word in quotes, you know, people call out 9-11 media fuckery or chemtrails or vaccines or all these things that, you know, a lot of people in that alternative media can agree there's something not quite right about what's being pushed with all those sorts of things. But then the question is, well, how do you deal with it? And then if you go to spiritual views on that, that's where everybody tends to disagree. And to me, that is actually the heart of the matter, right? Like how you view the metaphysical world is going to really indicate how you act in the world. And and it's a combination of, you know, your heart and your soul, and then in conjunction with metaphysical viewpoints that also make sense to you, or they, you try to make sense of them. And so It seems to me there's a lot of different viewpoints that there's fundamental things that bring you back to being under the puppet strings of some of these elite groups tied to this Talmudic Sophia or wisdom, I would call it. Again, that's really the distinctions here. And that's what I try to do. And that's actually a Catholic concept. I mean, go back to the Apostle Paul. A lot of people will say he's a Gnostic. But then once you look deeper into it, you realize he's using Gnostic language because he's actually combating Gnosticism at that time. And that's part of the teaching. You're using the language of your opponents or the people you're trying to evangelize or try to get them to see maybe they're on puppet strings. And you try to make a greater good out of that and harmonize the the right things and then purge the bad things, right? And so that's a constant theme of like just my entire life. And then I realized that you can apply that. For me, unifying these two pillars of Protestant Christianity and occult gnosis in ways that I just found to be, I don't know, healthy. And I I had already kind of resonated with and come to conclusions on my own, generally speaking. And again, there's, there's viewpoints that I still struggle with and stuff like that. But my whole point is that at least just considering or looking at this viewpoint and being aware that maybe some of the stuff that's being promoted out there in the world of occultism is not as it seems. And maybe there's some roots to parts of it that are a little disturbing. And I think that, you know, the idea of the seed growing a tree you know, the fruit down the road uh, that will be born, I think that it takes a while for some of those things to develop. And even with our current state of America right now, I think that some of the problems that we see actually stem back to enlightenment principles, despite us being so programmed to always want to go back to 1776, if you can see what I'm saying. So Catholicism is kind of like the antithesis in some ways of 1776, but there's actually still some strange sort of natural law principles built into it, but how do you define natural law? So again, this gets into a lot of stuff where there's buzzwords you'll hear, you know, humanist renaissance stuff. What does that mean? And and you can define it in kind of different ways. And that really ends up being the battle of distinctions and 
that's kind of what I, I find the, the modern world is trying to get you to stop looking at distinctions. And that's really the, the heart of the new world order, I think, where we're not supposed to make any distinctions now. That's the worst thing you could possibly do in the world we live in, you know, and I think that that's just a weapon for certain groups to rule over you. Yeah. And I would love it if you could also tell us a little bit about this term old world order. And we've touched on it a little bit here, but, you know, how did these oppose each other, this old and new world order? And, and why do we not talk about the old world order in the same way that we talk about this new world order that's supposedly scary and terrifying? You know, what are some of the key differences here? Well, I guess uh, the old world order is just Christendom, Catholic Europe. And that started at the conversion of Constantine, 313 AD, the Edict of Milan. That is, in the Protestant viewpoint, (laughs) is where everything got corrupted. Um, That's where paganism entered Christianity and then the, the Catholic Church is evil and the beast. But from the Catholic perspective, that's where the empire of Christ rose and started to convert pagan nations and uh, emperors and and monarchs. And so what's very interesting is that's roughly the thousand years we're supposed to think is darkness, right? That's the dark ages. We can't go back to that. That's the old world order, right? But what ended up happening is that the doctrine was that, you know, the Pharisees killed Christ, the Jews killed Christ. And so this is why during that time, there were laws against usury. You're not supposed to have fractional reserve banking or money at interest and stuff like that. That's a mortal sin. So there would be no federal reserve debt system in the old world. <laughs> That's one thing. At least during that thousand years. And then once the Renaissance papacy starts creeping in, that's when some things start to change. And of course, that's where everyone on the Enlightenment side will say, oh, thank God we started getting some enlightenment during that time. But ironically, that's when we have Medici banking and the Talmud starts to be allowed. And I call the Talmud just Sophia in the Gnostic sense, because you'll find a lot of ties to the mentions of Gnosticism being tied to these Jewish elites who are their powers going away because of Christianity and the Roman Empire. And so this is a thousand years of darkness where these Jews aren't allowed into power because they have these doctrines of racial and spiritual supremacy in their their talmud and this is the uh, destruction of the temple that was predicted by christ you know in 70 a.d and then the diaspora and they're dispersed right so they're in exile and they view this as kind of like in the bondage of egypt kind of like an old testament parallel so the problem is there is an old testament component but how do you define that how do you decipher that and so during this time period they aren't allowed into power and Catholicism is rising and the, the, the pagans are converting, you know, uh, the, the Merovingian kings and stuff like that. They're uh, converting to Catholicism. And so that's kind of the whole point is that that's a thousand years of darkness that we can never go back to. But what's ironic about it is that there was no usury or debt slavery and these Talmudic Jews were not allowed into power. And so you start looking at today of, you know, a disproportionate amount of that particular group being in power and things don't seem to be getting a whole lot better. And you start wondering, why do we call it the dark ages? You know? And so that is, even if you like read some of these like globalist plans, it seems to be that everything that they want to eliminate is any ties to this old world order. And that really ties to the mass immigration into Europe now, you know, and people like Barbara Spector, who admits that Jewish people are behind this, and that Europe's not going to be the monolithic country it was once, and now it needs to go into multicultural mode. And Jewish people are going to be resented because of their leading role for doing this. <laughs> so they get to play the anti-Semitic card, and they say that we're the ones doing this, but you can't criticize us for it. And now we have to flood Europe with migrants, and that is what is going to evolve humanity and bring it to this great multicultural paradise or utopia. So... That's kind of a problem if you, it's like, who made you boss to do that? You know what I mean? And so you start seeing that there is a motivation to destroy Europe by these group because they were held in power. And so then you have to argue what was really going on during this time. And, you know, are are there also people who are involved that, uh, you know, are part of Judaism that they end up getting screwed over as well because of their oligarchy behaving badly. So it's almost like they devour their own. And so this gets into the Inquisition, all the the battles in Europe and all these weird things and crazy things going on. 
this is all part of the history that, you know, sort of gets a washed over in modern world or gets a particular interpretation on it where we're supposed to view that as all the dark ages and stuff like that. Yeah. And you've mentioned the Talmud a few times here. And that's a text that is pretty central to your video series and your work here in this. But I don't know if everybody listening would be familiar with that text. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, as far as I understand it, it's like a a series of discussions from rabbis over the years and like interpreting the Torah and is like a, a written tradition, which, you know, is the the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, and then like, you know, some of the Old Testament prophets, basically the, the Old Testament as we know it. And then there's a separate oral tradition to interpret that. And that ends up becoming rabbinical Judaism after the destruction of the temple. And the issue for me is that th- there's a lot of stuff as far as it's like apparently volumes and volumes on this. And so there's all kinds of stuff in there. And when you start reading through some of it, you can read a lot of it online. You'll notice strange passages where there's not such nice allusions to the Goyim you know, being beasts and cattle, but then they have these rebuttals and saying like, oh, well, this is just one rabbi's opinion or, you know, this this was from a long time ago. We don't view it like this anymore. Or There's all these like kind of excuses. But again, when you have these things, what's to stop somebody from interpreting it that way, especially when they can't really agree on a particular interpretation? It's, it's very ambiguous, right? So is that like a tool of deception? You know, you, you keep things ambiguous. And then if you do some word magic to convince people that it's not about enslaving you <laughs> or at least like what's to prevent, you know, somebody from viewing it that way. Then that's kind of an issue. And I do believe that there's some interpretations of it that are unfair. And I think that some people kind of go to like extremes that it, it's kind of like, again, how I view the Protestants viewing the occult where they, they try to take something out of context and think that people are espousing like baby sacrifice or something like that when it's just not really true. You know, it's kind of like people saying Crowley wanted to sacrifice babies because he made the joke about masturbation. It doesn't mean I agree with Crowley's philosophies, but I'm not going to tell people that he was killing babies like a lot of people view that. You know what I mean? Like it's that extre- mm-hmm. extreme version that actually really only helps people like Alistair Crowley, if you can see what I'm saying. But the main fundamental point is that there's this book called Jesus in the Talmud by this scholar, Peter Schaefer, and he's a very respected scholar, and I think he's a Jew himself. So this isn't somebody out there with an agenda to, you know, interpret the Talmud. So if you read through that book, it's incredible, just whenever Jesus is talked about in the Talmud, it basically, he's, he's the son of a, a whore, Mary, he's the bastard son of a heathen Roman soldier. So they're trying to make Jesus part of the pagan nations. They're trying to equilibrate him to a, a pagan Roman soldier who would worship pagan gods and that the the woman who birthed him is a harlot or a prostitute and that he does black magic and that he's basically a heretic and he's, he's a demon basically. <laughs> and so he's not written about a lot in the Talmud, but when he is, it's always polemical. And none of the stories are really that, they're not really cohesive but they're always polemical. And you have instances where they're relating him to the King of Tyre, which will tie to Hiram King of Tyre, which ties into Freemasonry. And and you could tell that they, they, they know the gospels and they find the gospel of John particularly offensive. And once you understand the Talmudic viewpoint on Jesus, and then you compare that with Freemasonry and theosophy and occultism, and you start to realize that a lot of those viewpoints really come from the Talmud, but they're disfigured, they're echoes, they've been transmuted with a little bit of a piece missing. And this gets into the idea of the golem. And so if they have this vehement disdain for Catholicism and, and that version of Christ, and then you combine that with the history and also that the gospels confirm this, that the Pharisees think Jesus is a demon <laughs> and they, that's the whole point of them killing him. He claims to be the Messiah. They think he's a pagan heretic and he's like, he, they think he's like a master demon, like, like a super powerful one. And then in the old Testament, when you want to curse somebody, you hang them from a tree. So they're trying to curse him. And then, you know, if people talk about the cross being like this pagan symbol. I mean, it fits the story. They think he's a pagan God. So, Hey, how convenient we have the Roman execution throw him on a cross and it's, it's a wood, 
you know, wooden cross. So it's part of a tree. So this will hang him from a tree. So we get our rabbinical curse and he's thrown on a pagan symbol. So it's kind of like a, you'll find these, all these curses, these rabbinical curses that they try to do. And then you start realizing that the way they go about this stuff, they reverse context. They do all this word magic. They do these Kabbalah curses, transmuting words like virgin into a panther or a beast to attack Mary and stuff like that. And so once you understand that context, like forget about all the other stuff in the Talmud or whatever, it's obvious that there is a, a very strange hatred for the figure of Jesus. And a lot of the rabbis will try to pretend like it's not talking about the Jesus of the gospels. But once you read through it, they call him the Nazarene. Like it just parallels everything you read in the gospel. So it, it's like the onus is on them to prove it. That's what this author says. And so once you understand that battle and that there is an intense animosity in the Talmud, granted, there's a lot of writings in the Talmud. They call it the ocean of the Talmud. And there's like a proverbial drop in it about Jesus. And you can see some of these concepts in like, you know, new agey stuff where everything is this ocean of oneness and kind of stuff. And so once I started looking into some of these viewpoints, you start to notice some strange patterns that really permeate into theosophy and Freemasonry. And even in theosophy, Blavatsky says that the true Templars, as she calls them, which they, she thinks of the heretical Kabbalists, were following the doctrines of the Talmud and they believe that Jesus was the, the son of Ben Pantera. So they even admit that they're following the Talmud on some level in Freemasonry and theosophy. So isn't that strange, but are they missing another context to it? And this will get into the idea of the golem. So before I ramble on anymore, I don't know if there's anything you wanted me to clarify there. Well, there is more that I'd like to talk about before we get to the idea of the golem or the golems, as you have outlined in your video series. So uh, mm -hmm. that's a good probably teaser for a later part of the chat. But before we get there, you know, it's probably best to tackle some concepts of Satan, I think, because this is actually how we structured the chat here. We pulled out a series of videos from your series, uh, 8.0 to 8.17. So we just sort of like introduced the series, the first like 30 minutes here, and then the rest of the time we're going to be talking about this chunk of work here. So if people want to actually go to the YouTube channel, these are the videos that we'll be talking about. So uh, they're a bit later in the series, obviously, but I think some good principles to start our discussion with in general, because I'm, I'm sure this will bleed over into multiple podcast recordings. But let's start with the concept of Satan, the adversary to humanity in the Bible. But there's an old world Satan and there's a new world Satan. What are the differences between the two, Mike? Yes, exactly. And that's the distinction I try to make. And you can use the tarot card, the devil, to kind of illustrate this, which I'll get to in a second. But from the Catholic perspective, and again, this does bleed into some elements of Protestantism, of course. But the difference is the Protestants will actually think that the Catholic Church is Satan. So that's kind of the, the funny irony here. But as you can kind of derive from the Bible and then also combining it with, uh, I, I think I use this Brill book, Dictionary of Demons and Deities in the Bible, which is, you know, a secular book on um, viewing the Bible. So I'm, tr I'm trying to use university sources combined with, you know, Catholic theological sources and, and other things. So it's not just a, a biased viewpoint that is extracting all this from its many different sources. And so anyways, Satan just means the adversary, the slanderer or accuser, and it's seen as the adversary of humanity. So in Catholicism, it is seen as a personal created being, but it's like the original rebel and you can derive words like revolt or fall away or seduce from Satan. And there's also sort of a political or military or lawyer context to it, being like adversary in a military way or a political way, and then an accuser in like a lawyer kind of way. So it's kind of funny if you watch the movie The Devil's Advocate, there's kind of like a little bit of this expressed where Al Pacino, the, the Satan figure, is, is John Milton. And Milton's seen as like, heretical to the Catholic church where like paradise lost Satan is kind of loosely the hero, you know, a misunderstood figure. And so, you know, he's like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to get into law because you need lawyers for everything in the world. Right. And then this is kind of the idea of the Pharisees where they use the law to their advantage. They're obsessed with the law. Right. And you know how like 
you read through a contract and there's like a billion things, the average person is going to want to read through that. And so you kind of get screwed over through all these stipulations and stuff like that. And so that's kind of a way that uh, using law and twisting them and trying to seduce people into understanding it on the adversary's terms, not God's terms. And that, you know, obviously the, the Bible, the original story example of that, right? Twisting God's words to make the apple and the gnosis seductive and, and tempting to become like God, right? And that's the, the point about Satan in the Bible in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Those are the, the books that best describe the attributes of Satan along with this slander or user adversary of humanity. And so the idea is Satan hates humanity and finds them to be lesser, lower, and, and beast-like, <laughs> perhaps. And so, you know, that's not exactly described every single detail, but this is what you can kind of extract. So it's kind of like a, a related to astrology, the functions of Venus. Satan or the adversary is created good because the idea is that God creates things good, but everybody has free will. So you are allowed to choose because otherwise you'd just be a robot, right? So free will is a central core element to Catholicism, whereas some sects of Protestantism have these sort of predestination viewpoints and stuff like that. And even like astrology, there's like that more ancient fate astrology where you're just bound to your birth chart kind of stuff. So this is kind of like part of that dialectic where on occult, the occult side of things or the pagan side of things, there's almost like mirroring that happens on the Protestant side with certain aspects, right? And so this is sort of like a lack of free will. Now, obviously, there's certain, I'm not saying all occultists view that you don't have free will and, and more modern astrology, they tend to view it as more that way. But I'm saying in the ancient world, most astrology was tied to this sort of like faded or predetermined kind of thing. So anyways, what you can extract is that th this created being of this adversary was the ultimate in charm, intellect, wisdom, beauty, perfection. It was seen as being endowed with musical abilities. So these, these are kind of like the Venus. That's why he's, you know, it's called the morning star, star of the morning, right? So interestingly enough, in the Catholic viewpoint, you have all these sort of quote unquote astro theological terms that you can use, but they don't view it as all mythology. They don't view it as only that is overlap where it is a part of the consciousness of people, right? And so this is the part of a strategy that resonated with me where there's certain things that are represented in a chart or certain planets and how they, they have certain themes or attributes, but how they manifest in your life is based upon your free will. And so you can attribute the Venusian aspects to Satan, very charming, very uh, beautiful and harmonious, right? And that's kind of like Satan before fall. Uh, before his pride. And so you can see this paralleled in the idea of Israel. If there's a certain sect of mankind that is created to be the light or the uh, anointed one to lead everyone else, you know, because Satan is put in a position of prominence, right? And so you, you're supposed to be the beacon of light for all the, the beings that are below you. So there's like a chain of command. But when you don't behave in the right way in accordance with God's laws that are just and good, at least this is the viewpoint, then you become prideful and you're, you're going away from truth. And then you start becoming your own God. So this is why Israel in the Old Testament, when they didn't behave, they got punished. And that is sort of like the idea of the Messiah coming, that the Jews that rejected the Messiah turned into the spirit of Satan because they're rejecting God. So it's almost like an as above, so below thing enacted through humanity. And that is actually part of like a cultism level where it is seen as like the consciousness of human beings, a lot of these like astrological archetypes and whatever. So I think there's an interesting sort of harmony between these viewpoints, but obviously there is this personal aspect that these are real battles in heaven, real beings, the, a personality sense. And so the difference is Satan cannot repent. The angels or these angelic beings are born with all the knowledge that they have, but they do have free will. Whereas mankind learns, mankind, you know, has the capacity to learn more and, and change and do sorts of things and, and, and sort of evolve in, a, in a, not in the Darwinian sense, but just in a progress sense of like learning more or, um, you know, 
almost like creating parts of the reality. I want to say all the reality, but parts of it. And so this is the distinction. And then so what happens is the, the word until happens. All these beautiful things were part of Satan until he had pride. And so you can look at this as the opposite of Venus, like Mars, you know, like sulfur, phosphorus, where in astrology, Mars is more about like your ego, your anger, your vengeance, your pride, your aggression, your your warring against something out of your own false pride. What's profane, right? And so this is sort of like the story of Satan where he had his pride where he wanted to be equal with God, wants to sit on the throne of the recesses of the North and have equality with God. And so what's interesting in all of this cult alchemy, you're trying to reach an equilibrium, right? So this reflects the biblical narrative, but in a different way. And also another interesting thing is the United Nations, their, their symbol, a lot of people look at it like, oh, it's the earth, right? We won't go there. But I'm just saying like, what's interesting is that's actually like almost like a target of 33 section is targeting the North. So Satan wants to re- ascend to the recesses of the North. That's where his throne is. Again, it's kind of ambiguous what the North really means. But it's interesting that in Freemasonry, the North is a direction of darkness. And obviously they tie this to like the winter solstice and stuff like that. But there is sort of this inversion parallel there. And so you can kind of relate it to this imbalanced nature of Venus and Mars if you want to like throw the astrological functions on it. And so to kind of wrap it up, He's seen as an angel of light, but it's a false light. He wants to control and devour and exalt himself. And he's going to fool everyone with these light and love founding things. But it's really just darkness. Kind of like, um, you know, if somebody comes at you and they have a baseball bat and they're really angry and they're, they're going to be like, I'm going to kill you. At least you know that they're after you versus somebody's coming to you with flour on one hand. They, behind their back, they have a knife and they won't give you that knife until you start disobeying what they want you to do, or they'll try to manipulate somebody else to hit you with that knife. Then maybe they'll end up doing it themselves. That's kind of like the way I would view it, right? This just all of those wonderful qualities of wisdom and beauty and perfection turned in the opposite direction. So that's why it's seen as very tough to distinguish between the truth and the fall in this world. And that's part of the battle, the war in heaven manifested through mankind and something like that. So that's kind of what you can extract from the Bible on the attributes of Satan. Now, I know a lot of people argue that, well, in these passages, they're condemning kings. So they're not talking about Satan. That's kind of an erroneous opinion because that's a theme in the Bible where Satan is the spirit behind particular people in humanity or rulers. And that in parts of these passages, they refer to him being in Eden and stuff like that. So how is the king of Babylon or the king of Tyre hanging out in Eden when they're just a human being? So some of these these arguments people will make to sort of qu- try to debunk this are kind of silly unless you understand the the tradition and the context and there, there's a theme that goes throughout the bible of and so that's really the essence of satan or lucifer or whatever and i do believe that there are sort of astro theology parallels to it but i also think that this is another kind of dialectic where the occult is to take these things as all myth all allegory nothing is literal Whereas the Protestant side tends to take it as all literal. It's interesting how that's kind of disconnected, but the the Catholic viewpoint kind of merges them together in certain ways. And so, again, there's another strange alchemical unification of those two opposites that I find parallels so many other things and other themes that we'll probably get into. Yeah, we definitely will. And you've mentioned the Pharisees a few times as well so far, and I'd like you to tell people a little bit about that group, who they are, and I guess also, as we were just talking about Satan, how they're connected to that idea or that concept or that figure, and also what you call in your video, the curse of the Pharisees. Sure. So the idea is that the Pharisees are of this spirit of the adversary. So it's, again, kind of like an above below thing. There's that war in heaven where Satan rebels and has his angels or messengers, if you will. And then now there's this issue with this happening when the Jewish Messiah comes. Again, whether you believe this to be true or not, this is just the viewpoint. So these Pharisees basically, uh, they kill and reject God. That's the, the Catholic teaching. And so there's things you can extract from the Gospels about how they go about doing this, how they go about their uh, deception. 
and whatnot. So there's a I have a, a copy of the Ignatius Study Bible of the New Testament, which has been very helpful for the research because that gives you the, the Catholic viewpoint and, and uh, commentary on the New Testament. And they also summarize different themes, like they'll have a whole page entry on who the Sadducees were, who the Pharisees were, and they combine extracting this from the New Testament writings and also historical writings of the time period. So they're using both sources. So basically, this is how the Pharisees operate according to the Catholic viewpoint. They try to discredit people in front of the masses, and so in this instance, they're trying to discredit Jesus, so they try to set him up in these public places to answer these tough questions, and they try to trick him so that the masses can hear him give a stupid answer, and they'll turn against him. But every time it happens, it kind of gets turned back on them, and so they get more and more upset. And these Pharisees have a a dislike or a hate for the quote-unquote impure Gentiles or pagans. So they're they're elitist, basically, and they have a, a racial pride. So this is like a precursor of, like, Zionism in a way. They're obsessed with rituals. Everything is very ritualistic, and they have these purity laws and all these things tied to, like, you know, like they're obsessed with, like, circumcision, the Sabbath, food laws, and they also have this sort of philanthropic viewpoint, but it's like this pride of, like, oh, we're doing good for humanity with our philanthropy, but it's it's only done in pride, to, in self-righteous ways. And then they have oral traditions alongside of the Old Testament, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. And so this is, would be the, the Talmud, what becomes the Talmud once it's eventually written down, and the Kabbalah. So these are doctrines outside of the Pentateuch. They have great sway with the masses, but they're an elite group. There's not many of them, but they they know how to manipulate the masses, and they shut up the kingdom of heaven for both the Jews and the Gentiles, but particularly the Jews, because obviously they're seen as parts of their their spiritual leader or their aristocracy on some level. And there's different sects in Judaism during these times. There's you know there's the Essenes, there's the Sadducees, Pharisees, etc. But the Pharisees are the ones that really receive Christ's rebuking and wrath because they're called out for their hypocrisy and their self-righteousness and exalting themselves over other people. And they also believe in the supernatural. They believe in mystical things. So think about that in conjunction with today, with, you know, people running media in Hollywood, great sway with the masses. And there's all this occultism now that's really coming out in Hollywood. A lot of that has been ramped up over the past 10, 15 years. You know, there's an obsession with food laws. And it's pretty interesting that so much of our food has kosher labels on it. And how many people in the United States or the Western world are Jewish? I mean, it's a very small percentage. But, you know, I pick up my seltzer water here and I see the little U mark on it. That's a little strange that we all have to have kosher laws. And that's part of what the Pharisees do. They're obsessed with food laws. And then the philanthropy aspect, you know, think about the UN philanthropy, all these sorts of things. That's what New World Order researchers will call out, that so much of this stuff is done under NGO shit, right? Philanthropic, basically, um, oppression. (laughs) And discrediting people in front of the masses, right? I mean, that's kind of what happens to a lot of people. They get thrown on a a television show and and ganged up, or they, they... the hosts control the narrative and the questions and stuff like that. I mean, these are like tactics that people in the truth of the world always call out in the media. So I'd say that there's a lot of interesting parallels with what might be modern day Pharisees. And these are parallels that we can find in ourselves too, you know, when we're not behaving so well. And I think that that is an important thing to remember. This is a consciousness. It's not about race But these particular Pharisees like to make it about race. So this is the distinction here. Catholicism is not about race whatsoever. There is an important to ethnicity and cultures and things like that. But the spirit supersedes all of that. And so that's why Catholicism is not supposed to be based on racism, even though throughout Europe there can be difficulty struggling with that um, without battles. And, you know, that's just a natural byproduct of humanity and and dealing with living with each other, right? But the Pharisees play the race game better than most. That's kind of like the point. Now, there's also the Sadducees. Now, Christ has a problem with the Sadducees, but much only in like one particular instance. So 
Most of his beef is with the Pharisees, but he is at odds with the Sadducees with certain things. And here's what you can derive from the Catholic Study Bible, is that the Sadducees, they mix with the nations. They don't have a problem evolving with the times. They don't have a problem intermingling. They're kind of like, they would want to be accepted by the Gentiles, and they promote peace, tolerance, and unity, but they kind of compromise themselves, and they're atheistic. So they might be like, you know, Jewish in their background, in their culture or something, but they don't really believe in God. They're, they're just kind of like, it's just our tradition, whatever, but I believe in science or something like that, right? And so they're, they're going to want to promote peace and tolerance and unity, but they also want to stay relevant. They want to stay in power, stuff like that. So Christ calls them out for their atheism. They don't believe in the resurrection, so he has a little encounter with them, questioning them about that in re- regards to marriage in heaven and stuff like that. And the other interesting thing is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are at odds with each other. They don't like each other. So the Pharisees view the Sadducees as kind of like the nations because they intermingle with them. They don't mind evolving with them. So there is a beef between them. And then the Apostle Paul kind of takes advantage of that beef later on to kind of get out of a a, a pickle, basically, when he's confronted by the Sadducees. So those are the two main distinctions. And it's pretty interesting that, you know, there are a lot of people who kind of have a Jewish background, but they tend to be more atheistic. I mean, this is I, I know a lot of people that are like this, that the people I know that are have Jewish backgrounds tend to not really believe in God or they just kind of are agnostic about it, but they still sort of identify it with as a tradition and it's kind of like the more left leaning types. And again, I'm just kind of generalizing here. Obviously, I can't stereotype every single person, but you kind of have to speak with some generalities because they they are true to an extent. And so I think that if you take this teaching that's derived from the Bible supposedly 2,000 years ago, I think you can find a lot of modern parallels to what's going on to today. Yeah, indeed you can. And there was also a group of Pharisee adepts, if I'm not mistaken. I think you uh, mentioned them in your video. They were called the Shulhani. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But Christ had an encounter with this group, uh, which he referred to or was referred to in a text, I believe, as maybe in the Bible, as the synagogue of Satan. Could you tell us more about this Shulhani group of Pharisee adepts? Yeah, the Shulhani, if you go to um, Encyclopedia Judaica or the Jewish Virtual Library, they talk about them. These are the, the money changers in the temple that Christ basically kicks out. This is like one of the times where Christ gets really mad, where there's merchants and bankers doing money lending in the Jewish temple. And so this is another aspect of extracting the practices of you know, these Pharisees, or at least the, the Jews that are not in line with God that, that Christ is condemning. So you have mercantilism and banking <laughs> tied to this. And so this is sort of like one of the themes throughout Europe is that the, the Jewish bankers and the Jewish merchants are trying to expand and also intermingle with the aristocracy and become bankers to European monarchs and stuff like that. And, you know, obviously this gets into things like Rothschild banking and stuff like that, you know, them being fundamental to the creation of Israel and um, these sorts of things. So what the Old Testament reveals is all of these things together, right? This sort of elitism, this sort of Zionism, this sort of aspect of caring about money and exchange in the temple rather than God itself. But then there's aspects of these rabbis that pretend that they know God or they, they, they tell you that they have the keys to, to heaven or the kingdom. They're the ones who should bring in the, the Messiah through their doctrines and not this Jesus guy who's just a man and a carpenter and some demon who thinks he's God. So that's kind of the, um, the aspect of the Shohani as far as I understand it. Yeah, and, you know, I was curious about the Pharisees and their, I guess, view of God, if they were monotheistic, did they have multiple gods? How did they view that concept? As far as I can tell, I mean, seems to be monotheistic, especially when you get into Kabbalah, but that's a different understanding. It's like the Ein Sof Trinity, in a way. Ein, Ein Sof, Ein Sof R. And that's sort of like the spirit outside of the created world. But as far as like, the deeper theology behind that, I don't really know exactly. A book people can check out if they'd like. There are some things in it that I think can be a little bit on the extreme side with certain things, but it still has a lot of good information. It's called Judaism Strange Gods by Michael Hoffman. I think that that kind of gives you a, a good overview of some of the factors that might be at play, and he uses a lot of sources from rabbis, also Jewish historians, and just the Talmud itself. 
And it's one of those books that if you go look on Amazon, it's very bipolar in its reviews. A lot of one-star reviews, a lot of five-star reviews, very controversial. And he has an 1,100-page book. That's the expansion of that, Judaism Discovered. I don't own that, but 1,100 pages on it all (laughs) kind of says a lot. So I I can't really give anybody an ironclad definition of that. But from what I see in the echoes of occultism, uh, it seems to be monotheistic in this sort of, I I guess... uh, panentheism of some sorts, again, based on Kabbalah, the Ein Sof, the, the unity of the God spirit outside of the created world. And then that emanates into all these principles and stuff like that. And, you know, there's that whole hierarchy of these principalities in Kabbalah, which they relate to like angels and stuff like that. But obviously in Gnosticism, it's sort of like the aeons and, and things of that nature. So that's probably the best answer I can give you on that. Well, it's better than the answer that I could give you on that. So I do appreciate that. <laughs> Moving forward in the series now, we've touched on uh, 8.0 to 8.4 so far, and uh, we're almost to what I think is the best part of this. But before we get to the uh, the golems, I do want to talk about this Kabbalistic curse on Christ that you talk about in video 8.5. And in this video, you use this phrase, the Talmudic alchemical equilibrium. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> well, again, part of the alchemy is unifying two things together, we could put it in a consciousness aspect, right? So you you take one viewpoint and then the other, and you transmute it to your will to form the equilibrium you want. And so I guess the the best way to explain this is going back to that Jesus in the Talmud book, where you're trying to take Christ and equate him, make an equilibrium of associating him with the bastard son of a, a heathen Roman soldier and then the birth from a, a harlot or a prostitute or Mary or Miriam. And so this is done through basically rabbinical curses and word magic. And what's very interesting about this book is it actually tells you that this is a practice in Judaism and these rabbinical sages where they, they use the Kabbalah and, and these reversals or these curses to curse the the Gentiles or the pagans or or pagan religion that they don't like. Remember, they're elitists. They think they're all cattle. And then, but also Jesus or Christianity, because again, they think that there's kind of a twofold aspect to this. They think Christ is a demon and of the nations, they call him a Samaritan, which is kind of like a, a racial slur. You're a Jew mixed with the nations kind of thing. So you're basically equal with beasts. If you're, you're, if you're not one of these rabbinical sages who studies this stuff, day and night and, you know, has all these secret gnosis keys. And so what happens, this is an example that I thought was very interesting. They take the word virgin, because obviously in Catholicism and Christianity in general, I mean, the the viewpoint is that Christ is, is born of a virgin, a literal virgin birth, despite anybody, you know, having a hard time believing that or not. That's, that's the viewpoint. And so obviously this was Christianity rising and, and deposing them. And so if they're angry at this and they think that Jesus is a demon, well, they're going to try to use some of their Sophia or wisdom to curse him. And so the way they do this is they take the word virgin in Greek, because again, during this time, they're part of the the Hellenistic culture. They're they're surrounded by it. They're surrounded by the Greeks. And this is why people like Philo, who we'll get into, is um, kind of messing with Greek culture and infusing Judaism into it but it's more of the Illuminist viewpoints. And so this word curse that happens is that they take the Greek word for virgin, which is Parthenos, and they transmute it by reversing particular letters or sets of letters to Pantheros. So what they do is they take the R and then they take the TH being its its own little separate group of just TH and then the N, and then they reverse it to become the word Pantheros, which is the Greek word for panther, or you think about a panther as a beast, right? So they're taking the Virgin Mary or Miriam, and they're making her into a beast or a panther. You know, you probably heard like the joke, like sex panther or something like that. I think it's like from fucking Anchorman or some shit like that. And so this is taking this virgin birth of Catholicism, and they're saying that Mary fornicated with this heathen soldier named Ben Pantera, because Pantera just means panther, like the rock band. That's actually, if you look up the etymology of the band Pantera, they say it goes back to a panther. <laughs> so they're saying like, oh, he's the son of a heathen Roman soldier, 
And this woman is associated with like a panther. She's a harlot. So they did this. They took two Greek words that have similarities, but they took the, the letters that actually reverse. So it's like taking two words that, okay, this is convenient. This word means panther. And here's a, this, this fits to, to reverse virgin, right? They're playing with word magic in the lettering. And then they just like rearrange the letters, just completely putting them backwards. And so th- this guy, Peter Schaefer, says that this is a direct curse. It's a deliberate distortion that is a well-known practice in Judaism of mocking pagan or Christian holy names by changing them to view them contemptuously. And they also say that they do this with other words like God and dog, not in the same way, but this these reversals. So I wonder if maybe this is why in some of this Freemasonry, they worship the dog star you know, Osiris, because in Freemasonry, they make Christ equal to Osiris, right? And so once you realize that the the Pharisees have a a vested interest in equilibrating, right, the alchemy, Christ with a pagan deity or his mother Mary with a harlot, then you can see that Freemasonry where they say, oh, Jesus is just Osiris, or he's just Mithras, or he's just Krishna, or, or, or Mary is just Isis, or uh, Astarte, or Diana, or whatever, then you can see that, well, Freemasonry and Theosophy are equilibrating him with the quote-unquote heathen deities. And you could say, oh, well, you know, is that just an accident? And then you start realizing that people like Philo, who was an a Alexandrian Jew who came from a Jewish noble family tied to the line of Judah and was part of a banking family, and he was an Alexandrian philosopher, and he was also an opportunist, kind of like a political animal, he's like the basis of so much of this Freemasonry, even their highest degrees. Albert Pike says that it's based upon Philo and Aristobulus, this other Alexandrian Jewish philosopher. And so Freemasonry is admitting that they are pulling their advanced stuff from Philo. But if Philo has an agenda where he, the, the Alexandrian Jews and their power is going away, that that's like one group that is tied to a lot of this, you know, this quote unquote gnosis of when the, the Jews were had their vitality. And again, I'm, I'm confirming this from the Jerusalem Post. They just admit this. This is Zionist media telling you this. So do you think Philo, if he's an opportunist, he was trying to formulate stuff into Freemasonry and Gnosticism to combat Christianity and curse the Christians by making their God equilibrant with a, you know, a pagan deity and then the, the mother of God equilibrated with a whore. And then you start realizing that he was blending it with a lot of the Egyptian Hermeticism, but they had like the he was taking the parts of like Egyptian religion that had a lot of sexual freedom of their gods, basically like sex cults, right? The the orgies of Bacchus, Dionysus, Isis, that kind of stuff. He was fusing that with the Kabbalah, basically, a, like a form of it, and that became Gnosticism. And so is that just using that to combat your enemy, but since you're making a doctrine for the quote-unquote goy, then they're calling it enlightenment. Is that still just a joke on the goy? But now they've transmuted Christianity where they've actually created what they want it to be. They've made an alchemical transmutation of like, hey, this is what Christianity equals, and we're in control of it, if you can see what I'm saying. And you start looking into the origins of Gnosticism, the Freemasonry, all this stuff, the evidence keeps mounting up of all of this fuckery going on with it. And that's why I'm very suspicious of these things being promoted now by all these New World Order institutions. The whole reason we have the Gnostic Gospels online is because of UNESCO funding it. Obviously, Hollywood is pumping out all the Gnosticism, the Matrix, stuff like that. And that's something we can expand upon more with the Golems. But when you have a book admitting that these rabbinical sages do these curses to make the virgin into a harlot and all this kind of stuff and make Christ into a pagan heathen, then there's motive and there's also evidence for it. So kind of disturbing. Yeah, it it definitely is. And we're actually going to get into some of that now for the Patreon extension. So we'll cut the free audience loose here. You know, we'll link to the videos that we talked about in the show notes uh, to the channel, obviously. And I know for a fact, Mike, that I would like to have you back to talk more about some of the other chunks of videos here because they're fascinating and obviously just, you know, want to put more of a spotlight on your work. I mean, your channel is already pretty popular as it is, but yeah, I just would love to have more conversations about this stuff. So do tell people where they can find the YouTube channel, what your handle is on there and where they can find more of your work if they're interested beyond YouTube. Well, the YouTube is where everything is right now. I do have a Vimeo channel. Um, What I'm going to do, I'm in the midst of doing, is creating a membership website for the research, and I'm going to try to go 
more into all these different aspects of European history in this battle. I have tons of books that I've been reading, tons of information that I want to give to people if they're interested. And basically, I know, I mean, I'm not stupid. I know your audience and I know a lot of this stuff is going to be antithetical to a lot of what they probably believe or, or are interested in. But I also like want people to know that I was into David Icke. I was meditating. I was trying to connect with spirits at one time. I was reading all this stuff and, and eating it up like it was the truth. And there's a lot of true things in it. And that's part of your journey and your process. So this whole thing is not a condemnation upon any people who are following these viewpoints. It's just saying, hey, at least be aware that there's uh, suspicious red flags with this stuff. And as long as people can listen to the Catholic viewpoint and realize that maybe it's not as much of your enemy as you'd like to think, even if you still don't like it, then that's all I really ask for. And so just I, I have a Twitter account. That's just an update of whenever I do anything, a video or an interview is released. I stay away from the comments section, but when I open up the member site, I'll have a forum where I can interact with more people because I can't hang on the internet all day. It's just too taxing on me. I do enough work on it that I can't respond to every comment, and it just turns into a shit show half the time. So people are free to email me about stuff, and I still do astrology readings. I don't know exactly when I can get to those. Obviously, it's transformed a bit on how I do those things, but the last section of this series has been all on astrology and how do I view it now or different ways you can view it that you might not have known. And I think there are more healthy ways of viewing the stuff. So that's basically, you know, my journey is similar with all these things where I believe that, same as you, you realize that you were a golem, you might have been on puppet strings, and that's okay because that's part of the journey but we need to be honest about things. And if we're going to say we don't want to be manipulated and we want to be individual free thinkers, maybe some things that seem like oppressive systems or seem like you're in an ignorant religious system or something like that, maybe there's been a coordinated effort by many different viewpoints that seemingly aren't connected to actually make you hate that, to play the scapegoat ritual where you're blaming something that's not responsible for something or all of its flaws. Maybe there's other groups that are even more draconian and evil that are hiding in the shadows that no one's able to point out because this stuff is very difficult and very hard to go through and very mysterious. And I sympathize with people in this journey wherever anybody's at with all of this stuff. Here, here, man. Amen to that. So, Michael Joseph, dude, thanks so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Always enjoy hearing your insights and your research presented in this format. So I do look forward to talking to you again about it soon. All right. Thanks a lot for having me back on. And there you have it. My thanks again to Michael Joseph, really spitting some fire here with material I've not heard presented anywhere before. Mike may be, maybe, the most original researcher in this field. The sheer amount of time he's put into the production of these videos, not to mention the amount of books and other resource materials he's poured through in order to piece together all this information. I am mesmerized at his attention to detail and his ability to connect dots that, again, I don't think anyone else has connected previously, at least that I'm aware of. And I think the most important question to ask after this is, what do you think? Is Mike onto something here? Is all this occult and esoteric doctrine that's so appealing to us just part of the greater grid of control that seems to be exerted over every facet of our lives? I mean, it would make sense that the major alternative spiritual belief systems would be part of that control grid, but ultimately that's not for me to decide, that's for you to decide. Most of us listening have challenged the church at some point or another in our lives. Hell, I've spent a few hours with Recluse looking at how damaging secret Catholic orders have been throughout history. But have we challenged the ideas in the systems that oppose the church? I honestly don't know what's true or what's not here, but I'm open-minded enough to sit and listen to a guy like Mike make his case, and I think at the very least his research is worth some discussion on this show and many others like it. And we continued the chat in the Patreon extension where we talked about an idea Mike calls the Golems of the Pharisees, including what a golem is and how it's used by Kabbalist adepts to attack their enemies, how H.P. Blavatsky in Theosophy views the Talmud and its teachings, how the teachings of Blavatsky and in turn the United Nations and the Rockefeller clan might just fit the bill as being one of these golem creations, the importance of Alexandria as a multicultural cosmopolitan paradise, how Alexandria relates to other holy lands and peoples of the secret doctrine such as Anatoly Fomenko's suppressed Tartary Empire. Fomenko's not a guy I've been able to talk about on this show, but Mike does mention him, and it's a pretty interesting mention. We also talk about how Freemasonry connects with the doctrines of the Talmud, Hiram Abiff as equal to Christ and other solar saviors of the mystery religion, how Philo, Gnosticism, and Paul's writings in the New Testament connect with the doctrines of the Talmud and its wisdom, or Sophia, 
how the 66 books of Protestantism connect with the doctrines of the Talmud and its wisdom and end-time prophecies. And finally, we wrapped up on the potential golems being created in the alternative media, or as Mike likes to call it, the truther world. As I said in the intro, this was another full hour on Patreon. These extensions are getting a bit longer. It's something I'm consciously trying to do here. I prefer 90-minute episodes, although some guests can only do 60, and most really don't like chatting longer than 90 anyway, which I get. But I'm trying to bring a bit more value to the Patreon, especially since I've taken more time to myself this year and more time away from the internet, which, as you might imagine, is problematic when you're trying to produce and promote a podcast that exists solely on the internet. That said, I do appreciate those of you who continue to support the show here, especially since I've started to struggle with this material myself, much like Mike has. You know, don't get me wrong, I still find value in it, I still find positive things to take from it, but I also find value in questioning myself and what I think or what I believe, and that's really the whole point of this show. It's why I started it. And anyone who wants to learn new things, but also question them if need be, you're more than welcome at my table. Speaking of which, my thanks to some new house guests, Christopher, Heather, Alex, and Jake. They signed up to support the Patreon campaign recently. And you can too at patreon.com slash oldculture, where two bucks a month gets you the extension for every episode. Five bucks gets you access to the raw episodes you hear clips of on the free feed from time to time. Ten bucks gets your name in the show notes as an executive producer and a free t-shirt after a couple of months of support. And twenty bucks a month gets you all of that plus a chance to sit in on these interviews if you want. No one ever takes me up on that though, which is cool. I get that too. And all those levels of support get you a discount on merchandise at our website, oculturepodcast.com slash merch. It's either 15 or 25%, depending on your level of support. And speaking of merch, we do have a new t-shirt available featuring the new logo for the show, the Pulp Magazine-inspired logo that you should be seeing on the feed by now. It's pretty slick, and my thanks to my friend Anna for helping design that. Also, plenty of non-patrons have signed up to win a Starboard session from Michael Wan, who was the guest in our previous episode, and there's still time to do that if you're interested. I won't be announcing the winner of that until the end of June. It's a big giveaway and a pricey one, so I'm running it a bit longer than the typical once-a-month giveaway I do on here. So if you heard the episode with Michael Wan and want a chance to win that Starboard session, email me at oculture at protonmail.com. And hey, we've got a hell of a summer lined up so far. The last three guests have been returning guests with three or more appearances on the show, which is insane to me. And I have another returning guest lined up who's making his second appearance on the show, Eric Davis. He'll be on in the next few weeks. But aside from that, it's all first-timers. Poets, witches, ufologists, magical philosophers, the best kind of intellectual smorgasbord. Although I am going to try to get Mike back on here to cover more of his occult Catholicism series. And I'm going to try to get Recluse back on as well, although neither of them know that yet. I'm also thinking of doing more health and wellness related stuff, whether that's part of this show, even though thematically it, it might not fit from time to time, or whether it's part of something completely new and different. That is more in line with my primary interests and passions these days, and I have enough knowledge on that topic to be dangerous behind a microphone with anyone who would give their time to me. I even have a working title for that project, which I envision as a podcast at first, but something much greater eventually. But we'll see. I'm trying not to count my organic pasture-raised eggs before they hatch. Either way, we're challenging paradigms one episode at a time, no matter the subject, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But for now, let's just chill until the next episode. Until then, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
please rewind this cassette.